May it please the court. My name is Ralph Brooks, attorney. I'm here for Robert Howell, who is here today, Terry Hoppenjohns, and Miles Friedland, the appellants uh, in this case. Uh, this is a case that deals with comprehensive plans and whether or not development orders are consistent with a comprehensive plan. It's a uh, case that's different from your typical zoning cases, which you may be familiar with. Zonings uh, are heard by certiorari and they're based on the record on appeal and transcripts. Uh, the Florida legislature in 1985 adopted the Growth Management Act. Uh, it's now called the Community Planning Act. And when they adopted that, they changed the rules of the game in terms of comprehensive planning. Comprehensive plans used to be a relatively unenforceable guidance type document. With the Growth Management Act, the legislature gave local comprehensive plans the force of law, and they placed the enforcement capability, or burden if you wish, of enforcing comp plans on citizens. Um, so the citizens are the ones that must bring a case if a development order is passed, and a development order includes well, a rezoning. Is, that's the ultimate question in this case, right? Is this a development order, and is this a development? You said this is different from the typical development case we see. This is a mining case. Nothing was going to be built. Nothing was really going to be developed. There was going to be minerals and sand and lime rock extracted from the ground. So is this a development mm -hmm. case, and is this a development order? Yes, this is a development order, particularly the modification to a conditional use. Uh, that, mo that conditional use is a development order. Development orders are defined in, in the statute, the Growth Management Act 163 Part 2, um, anything that materially changes the intensity or use of land. This property, in 2007, they applied for a sand mining permit, and in March, in July, they were granted what's called a master planned unit development. The plan was to excavate sand for five years to make a lake and build 19 homes around the lake. How do we, where do we go to look for a definition of a development? Would 380.04 Florida statute be the place? Well, you eventually get there. To walk you through, you start first at 163.3164. And they talk about a development order, means any order granting, denying, or granting with conditions an application for a development permit. Then in 16, it defines development permit. Development permit includes any building permit, zoning permit, subdivision approval, rezoning, certification, special exception, variance, or any other official action of local government having the effect of permitting the development of land. It also defines development to say development has the same meaning as in 380.04. This, this project can't go forward under a, a Department of Enviro Environmental Protection permit unless this resolution is entered. Is that correct? I mean, is this a condition precedent for them doing anything in the way of, of using dynamite there? There are two separate, actually three separate things that go on here. There's three layers of regulatory oversight on mining. One is the local function, and that's planning. Planning is where are the mines going to go. Right. Once they decide where they're going to go, then it goes to the DEP to permit the mine in that location with their own set of conditions. Blasting, which you raised at the end of your question, is also addressed at another level by the state fire marshal in terms of how uh, intense a blast you can utilize when you're doing a mine, measuring it with seismographs and that thing. Planning by the local government can take into uh, account that there is going to be blasting. The blasting can go to the maximum of the state fire marshal's regulations, um, and they can look at DEP giving a uh, mining permit. Local governments set up categories in their future land use map, uh, in this case agricultural rural, which is agricultural and residential rural. It doesn't mean that anywhere and anywhere everywhere in that ARR, which is quite a vast swath of the county, that mining would be appropriate. Sit, mining might not be appropriate if it was too close to a residential neighborhood. Our expert, this case was decided on summary judgment. We didn't get the de novo hearing that we asked for that the legislature grants to us with this statutory cause of action. We had an expert who provided an affidavit and a report 
that said that there would be vibrations that would cause bending of homes and also other vibrations that could cause structural damage. But the bending of homes and the human annoyance level extended out 4,773 feet from the blast or the mine. Uh, the clients, the appellants here in this case, uh, two of them live within 2,000 feet of the mine, so well within the range of human annoyance. So it, that's, b but these activities are confined to the lime rock part of the extraction. Am I right about that? In other words, the equipment uh, to used to extract and, and sort of crush the rock is what's going to make all of this noise, right? So the sand excavation part of it really isn't is not an issue here, is that correct? That's correct, and okay. I forgot to reserve time for rebuttal if I can reserve five minutes. Um, this, this lime rock mine is, is it, it used to be a sand mine where they would take the sand out and put it in a truck and drive it away. Uh, this lime rock mine not only, only involves blasting, which is much more noisy and vibrations that go with, noise is separate from vibrations, also involves an ancillary limestone processing facility if where we were, they crush if, rock into aggregate. If we were to conclude that the mining and the lime rock mining are within the parameters of the development code, does the issue then become whether there is a genuine issue of material fact as to whether the conditions imposed uh, as part of the board's approval are adequate or inadequate? Yes. Uh, yes, Your Honor, it does. And do the experts' affidavits address those conditions in any way? Yes, they do, and they're conflicting, and that's why a motion for summary judgment should not have been granted. In fact, the county itself, their own planning department, first the Development Review Committee denied the request for a mine. The Planning Commission recommended so that's denial. Really not, be, be that's not particularly relevant to whether there's still a genuine issue of, of material fact, correct? It Can is only to... Yes, it is a little bit, Your Honor, and to lay the fact that their own planning department found without those 43 conditions, it was inconsistent with the comprehensive plan, and that was their opinion. That was the opinion of the Planning Commission, and the Board of County Commissioners, in fact, initially voted to deny because it was inconsistent and, then it was and incompatible. And then what I'll call mediation process that yes. resulted in, in the, the resolution that's now being challenged, right? Yes. Um, my client, Bob Howell, who is here today, he went to the mediation. He did not agree to the mediated settlement agreement, so they did not reach agreement with all parties. The parties they reached agreement with, they went forward under threat of uh, suit, I'd, I'd like and to they go back, settled the case. I'd like to go back to my question. Yes. Your 43 conditions, I think I, I know where you're going. Well, let me, let me maybe explain it first, my okay. concern on it. You mentioned earlier the experts saying these vibrations will travel an extraordinary distance, which will, or I don't know if extraordinary is a fair word, but will travel a sufficient distance to impact your client's home. Does your expert say that notwithstanding these 43 conditions, these things will still happen? Yes, he does, and that's in his affidavit report, which, which is which attached to his affidavit. Dr. Glenn Ricks, also his resume, which is very, very extensive. He's been a professor at Georgia Tech University uh, my father's an engineer. He used to call him the Rambling Rex from Georgia Tech. Uh, he has uh, a quite extensive publication in the field, and he states that there will be, uh, will be uh, bending and it can be structural damage. In the conditions, the uh, mine puts up a $530,000 escrow account or $510,000 in order to cover damages. I'm looking at the affidavit as we speak. Okay, if so, you have a look at the report that's attached to it. Okay, so take me to into the report where he analyzes the efficacy or inefficacy, the lack of efficacy of the conditions that were imposed as part of the approval. Well, he, if you go to the very last page, the last two pages of his report, I believe he states there that 4773 is the closest it should be placed to residences or a residential neighborhood. This mine is closer than that. There's also a, an affidavit uh, and two affidavits actually from the expert planner. She's an American Institute of Certified Planner, uh, Susan Murphy, who has her own opinion that this is incompatible uh, with the surrounding uses and doesn't meet policies and objectives that are in the comprehensive plan. But she also utilizes that opinion of the expert in vibrations to say because there are vibrations, therefore it is not consistent with the comprehensive plan. So Dr. Ricks himself doesn't go into the comprehensive plan. He issues the 
expert opinion that vibrations will go out this far. Then the expert planner walks in because it's now in her field of expertise to analyze comprehensive plans and consistency and from land use planning perspective. He's a pure engineer. So she comes in and she says, because it goes this far and then encompasses this noise, these vibrations, uh, as part of her analysis on whether it's consistent with the comprehensive plan, she finds it's not consistent with the text of the comprehensive plan, which goes beyond just uh, is mining allowed in this area. What I'm trying to drive at is the 43 conditions that were imposed in theory would ameliorate all or some of the problems, or at least the other side's argument is it would ameliorate any of the concerns of the homeowners. And so I'm trying to get a handle well, who's on opinion, who's the opinion, experts Your Honor. talk about the comprehensive plan and they talk about this particular plan and the development code. Do they address, I'm trying to find where they address the conditions and say these conditions are inadequate and here's why. These conditions that are attached uh, were meant to bring it into consistency because previously the planning staff had found they were not. The planning staff for the county believes it did. My experts believe it didn't. There's a difference of opinion. If you can say that this hour uh, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. is now compatible and consistent with the plan and compatible with the neighborhood or blasting from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. three times a month, that uh, should be a, a material issue of fact where testimony can be taken from competing expert planners. In the affidavit of Susan Murphy, uh, she has two affidavits. The first one, she says that limestone mining and ancillary processing at this subject location is not consistent with featured land use element 1.4, protection of residential neighborhoods, which says, quote, to ensure the long-term viability of residential neighborhoods by regulating future development and redevelopment to create compatibility with surrounding land uses. She says, in her opinion, because the conversion of an excavation of sand as part of a planned residential development to a full-scale lime rock mine with its associated traffic impacts and sensory intrusions such as noise, vibration, and dust, the operation of rock, rock crushers and other heavy equipment does not ensure the long-term viability but of the I surroundings. But as I understand some of the conditions, they are designed to reduce some of the impact. And she, they are. does she address, I, I, I want to ask this very specifically, does she address that those conditions would not sufficiently ameliorate the concerns that she has expressed? Yes, uh, she, the, the, her uh, affidavit is based on this uh, approval, this conditional use approval that contains the 43 conditions. Her affidavit's in December of 2013. Uh, this resolution uh, was done before her uh, affidavits um, in May of 2013. That's what she was analyzing. The, uh, this conditional use contains all those 43. Her opinion, expert opinion, wasn't given before the mediation, it was given after the results of the mediation were approved. And uh, certainly these are gray areas uh, about whether or not uh, even $510,000 is sufficient. And if there is a $510,000 escrow to address damages, doesn't that in, in essence somehow look at that there could be damages uh, that resulting from the blasting that need to be addressed? I think what's important here is that this case isn't decided and it's final uh, after a de novo trial. Here we didn't get our day in court. We weren't allowed to present the expert that you're asking about and the other vibration expert at, to have them present their opinion subject to cross-examination, subject to weighing of the credibility uh, of, the, of the veracity of the testimony that each of the expert witnesses were, were going to give. Uh, admittedly, these plan policies are some gray areas. They're subjective, they're not objective. They don't say the operating hours of a mine must be seven to 7 p.m. It says the operation of a mine must be compatible with the surrounding neighborhoods. So it's a subjective test as to whether or not these 43 conditions are enough to make this mine compatible with this neighborhood. That's what we want to try. When we test these things, the, obviously the comprehensive plan here has been in, in effect for 25 years or so, but 
I get the impression, and I'm not sure how much is in the record about this, but apparently there's been some what I'll call residential development around this mine that I, I gather has taken place during the last 25 years. And so my, I guess my question is when we're deciding whether something's compatible with the plan, is it the plan as it has been implemented over time or not? When you're looking at the plan policy is about compatible with the existing surrounding uses, you would look at the existing surrounding uses. But the comprehensive plan is a long-term planning document that has a planning horizon of 20 or 30 years. They're supposed to be updated and reviewed every five to seven years, and in most counties they are. Um, so they do continually look at that. Um, my particular client's homes have been there uh, for a long time, longer than the sand mine. They didn't object to the sand mine because it was a residential development and they were just excavating the stormwater pond for a lake. That's that, and for footprints, for fill. That happens in every residential development. If every residential development can take their sand that they're removing from the site or using on site for fill and go ahead and say, well, you know what, now I'm going to make lime rock mines where I have the uh, stormwater ponds. Then that, that, that's quite a substantial change in intensity of development. Okay, thank you. We'll hear from the county. May it please the court, uh, Dave Smolker with the Smolker Bartlett Schlosser Loeb and Heinz firm. Uh, with me today is my associate Jessica Swan. Uh, also with us today is uh, Assistant County Attorney David Goldstein on behalf of the county. Uh, I will be speaking both for Outlaw Ridge, uh, who is the Appalee Cross Appellant, as well as the county. May it please the court. Before we get to the issue of whether there are disputed issues of material fact for summary judgment purposes, we have to get past the threshold question, is there jurisdiction, which you have raised and challenged. Can we go there first? Yes, sir. It's our, uh, it's our contention, Your Honor, that uh, the approvals in this case, the settlement agreement and the conditional use approval, are not development orders uh, that are challengeable under Section 163.3215. Uh, and the reason is really very simple. Let me just ask a question right there. So if it's not a development order, is there no appeal from what the county did? Your Honor, uh, that's, I, under, that's kind of the position you've taken, isn't it? It, it is, and, and I think the simple answer to that question is that I think it's Article One, Section 3 of the Florida Constitution guarantees a right of access to the courts. Uh, the question here is, what is the nature of that access? Is it a de novo trial? which is what the statute provides, or alternatively, is it the, the traditional petition for writ of certiorari in the circuit court, which is what the remedy would be if it weren't for section 163.3215. So although I, I don't want to waive any arguments that I might have at a later date, uh, I do think that sure. there's a good argument they have a right of access to the court um, and that the issues of consistency could be addressed uh, through a petition for writ of cert, and in fact, they had jurisdiction, but its jurisdiction would have been based on certiorari and not based upon each step. Yes, sir. I, I think that that's a fair assessment uh, of, of where we would end up because I, I don't think you can say they don't have a, a remedy. Uh, so it's not as if they're without a remedy. They do have a remedy. In fact, they have filed a petition for writ of cert um, in the circuit court uh, challenging the conditional use approval from the standpoint of whether it met the criteria for granting of a conditional use. Right. You're calling it a conditional use approval, but I noticed your client called it a conditional use permit. And that at least struck me that it looked pretty close to a development order if it actually were a permit. Uh, well, I think it has to have the effect of, of permitting development. And so uh, under the Robbins case, in order to determine if you're dealing with a development order, you must uh, make that decision with reference to the definition of so development. Is a, so is a limestone mine categorically not a development? No, it could be. And uh, uh, it could be. Uh, the definition of development, and I'm paraphrasing, is any material change in the use or appearance of land. And then it enumerates some examples. One of them is mining. However, uh, there is a, an exclusion later on in, in the definition, which is key in this case. And what it says is in section 380.043, uh, 
sub F, it expressly excludes from the definition of development a change in use of land or structure from a use within a class specified in an ordinance or rule to another use in the same class. And it's our contention, if you look to the definition of mining under the comprehensive plan, it's broadly defined to include all activities related to mining as well as mining. So it's an all-inclusive definition. Therefore, we would say it creates a class of use. That class of use is mining. Uh, we had sand mining is a one yeah, type of. A little bit with that because typically in Florida, sand mine is, you know, 30 feet deep. Sometimes it's deeper than that, but sand mines are not deep structures. Limestone mines go well down into the aquifer normally. Uh, I mean, I, I, I a permit to go down like 100 feet or so here, aren't you? Uh, Your Honor, my recollection is it's it's in the range of maybe 80 to 90 feet, but somewhere in that range. Yes, I, I think that um, sand mines go as deep as the demand for sand is. Uh, w I know under the regulations of the Water Management District, you can't breach an aquitard, which is a layer of sediment that protects the aquifer. So normally they don't go into the aquifer itself. Um, but I, our point here though, Judge, is that, is that what we have here is a change in use uh, from sand mining to lime rock mining within the same class of use called mining. And that fits squarely within the statutory exclusion from the definition of development. And because of that, uh, we, we can't say we're dealing with a development order. We're dealing with an order, no question about it, but it's not a development order that's subject to challenge under section 163.3215. And um, we have two appellate court cases that address that issue Although they didn't address that particular exclusion, they addressed another exclusion dealing with activities within existing rights of way. Those are excluded from the definition of development in both the Robbins case and the uh, Board of County Commissioners of Monroe County case. The court applied that same sort of analysis and said hey, we have a exclusion for activities within existing rights of way, therefore someone cannot challenge um, an order authorizing that activity under section 163.3215. And I believe the, the, the Monroe County case addresses the issue, Judge Morris, that, that you suggested, which is uh, it's not like they're without a remedy. I think in, in that particular case, uh, the court remanded it back and said that they have a, a remedy. It's just not a, a de novo trial under section 163.3215. And we think that's precisely the same situation we have here. Um, so that's our argument um, with regard to it not being a development order, and I, I think it's plainly and unambiguously not a development order that's subject to challenge. Okay, so then obviously the next place we go is the disputed issues of material fact. We have competing affidavits here of experts w which would seem to raise the critical issue in this case is whether this does or does not have an impact on the surrounding homeowners. Yeah, and, and I would suggest, Your Honor, that whether it has an impact on surrounding homeowners is ultimately not the inquiry here. The inquiry is, is whether it is consistent with the plan. Um, and we would contend that the trial court did not err in granting summary judgment. And we, we would base that on a couple of key points. First of all, it's critical to understand the hierarchical nature of land development regulation in Florida. The comprehensive plan includes a future land use element and a future land use map. That particular part of the plan is what defines the density intensity type of use that's allowed within a particular land use category. In this particular instance, both residential and mining are allowed in the AGR. So I, I guess, and, and this is a long ways from my field of expertise, so I'm struggling to learn on this stuff. But if if the county has made a decision, and I haven't seen the map, so I don't quite understand this, but apparently there are apparently platted residential neighborhoods within a mile or two of, of this mine. That is correct. If, if you've made a, the decision that as part of your comprehensive plan, it's going to be okay to do that, doesn't that, shouldn't that limit the intensity of what you can do at this mining location? As, as well, I, I think the answer to that question is yes, but it's not done through the comprehensive plan itself. 
because the comprehensive plan allows both mining and residential in the AGR land use category. But certainly it's the a comprehensive plan doesn't contemplate wrecking surrounding homes. Most definitely not. So, we, so this conflict in the affidavits about whether it will or won't do that, are you suggesting we just ignore it's not relevant? The answer is yes, as a matter of law, if you read the cases that we've cited in our brief, what you find is that the future land use map and element is a land use constitution. It is the establishment of the land use policy for that area. In this particular instance, the entire area that we're dealing with for the most part, including um, the, the, the residential neighborhoods, are all designated AGR. And so that was a policy decision that was made by the board. Now the board recognized by qualifying mining involving ancillary activities, it requires special approval. That special approval though is not implemented through the plan itself. And there are no other specific self-executing mandatory plan policies that would otherwise limit or restrict mining. That particular decision as to whether to allow it is relegated to um, implementation of the plan through the conditional use process. And there you have a regulatory structure that has specific criteria that have to be met um, in order to obtain the conditional use. And it also uh, primarily focuses on um, conditions that can be imposed to ameliorate and minimize the impacts that you are concerned with. But the idea that, that it would be in an impact free from mining area, you can't say that because the board has already as a policy matter said that mining and uh, residential uh, uh, areas are generally consistent and we're going to look to implementation of the plan through the conditional use process, which is challengeable through a cert petition um, in particular instances to determine whether we're going to grant the special approval. But in the final analysis, all the plan says is that mining is a permitted use. If you have ancillary uh, facility or ancillary activities, you have to have a special approval. It's undisputed that we got the special approval and it's undisputed uh, that that mining is allowed. And f for purposes of what the comprehensive plan says, which is what consistency is all about, um, we're, we're consistent. The issue of whether or not in a particular... Sir Dignan the limestone, it's fine gold, which seems unlikely. Or diamond. It's, it's, can, can we license a, a diamond mine and a gold mine because they're all mines? Is it all the same class? Yes. The, w the way it's been defined by Pasco County in their ordinance, which is what 38004 sub 3 requires that you look to. I mean, they define <coughs> mining all inclusively uh, with one definition. And the various types of mining are simply different types of mining within that same class. Uh, okay. So, so uh, we, we think that as a, as a matter of law, if you look at the case law, what you see is, I, th I think there's three principles that emerge from the case law that I think are very important for the court to understand. And, and admittedly, this is an area that can get a little fuzzy. Uh, but for purposes of this case, I think the legal principles that the appellate courts have enunciated are very straightforward and clear, and they're very consistent with the overarching principle that the future land use plan and element is a land use constitution. It's, it's not just another thing to consider in weighing. It, it is at the land use constitution, and it should be strictly adhered to, um, except where otherwise uh, there is some plan policy that would trump it. Well, um, if, in it this this, if it is a constitution, as you suggest, original intent, which we talk about in constitutional <laughs> analysis. Yes, sir. Would you agree that uh, Alton Burns' example of a diamond, a diamond mine or a coal mine or other kinds of mines would not have been contemplated as part of the development plan? Uh, in the case of, of Pasco County's uh, comprehensive plan, I, I well, let's put it this way. If there's diamonds in Pasco County, I'd like to know where they are. And uh, I, I, No, I don't think that they contemplated Real diamond mining. Are going up. But, but they certainly contemplated lime rock mining, and the reason we know that is because you can look to other provisions in the plan um, where uh, actually the zoning, which it, the property is zoned AC, which allows mining, and it actually says extraction of limestone. So it's very clear that limestone or lime rock mining was contemplated 
um, at the time that they and, uh, dropped Remind me, uh, I asked opposing counsel about the experts' affidavits and whether they were actually challenging the conditions that the board approved. And I recall in your brief, you said they really don't address those conditions. To challenge those conditions, is it your position that would have to be brought exclusively in the circuit court as a certiorari proceeding? Yes. And, and, and the reason, again, it gets back to this hierarchical structure. I mean, the case law ma makes it fairly clear to me, at least, that where you have the future land use plan allowing, explicitly allowing a particular use, um, then that use is going to be consistent with, with really only one exception. If there are other plan policies that are mandatory and self-executing and that are specifically applicable to that use that it would violate under some circumstance, then I think you could cite to that policy and say it's not consistent. But we don't have that here. The only qualification in the plan with regard to mining is in the case of ancillary processing where you have to go and get a special approval. All the plan says is that you have to get the special approval. Um, and the cases, uh, I think, are pretty clear. Uh, if, you, if you look at the consistency challenge cases, every single one of them um, that actually addressed the question of what does consistency mean involved a use that was allowed under the plan and that was challenged as being inconsistent. And in each instance, uh, including two cases, the um, Raymond case and the Gilmore case, which are cited in our brief, uh, the issue was decided on summary judgment basically on the principle that, hey, the use is allowed and you can't go and find sort of generalized, amorphous other policies and objectives in the plan and use those to trump the specific allowance of the use in the plan. And I think that that principle governs this case. And that's why the court was, trial court was, could decide it as a matter of law uh, because it, it almost doesn't really matter what the experts say, the, the issue of consistency has to be decided within the four corners of the plan and within the four corners of the development order itself under the Southwest Ranches cases. So we're not in a consistency case um, unless we can find a specific policy, self-executing, mandatory, and specifically applicable to a, an allowable use, the courts uh, are finding that it's, it's uh, consistent even though there may be other policies that you could attempt to invoke of a generalized nature to argue that it's not consistent. The only case that we found, actually opposing counsel pointed it out to me, where you actually had a consistency determination made by the trial court that it was inconsistent and went up on appeal and there's a discussion of that policy is in the Scheidel case. Uh, First of all, the Shadell case was decided on other grounds. It was not decided on whether it was or wasn't consistent. It was decided on the proper standard of review. But if you look at the policy, it is clearly mandatory, self-executing, and specifically applicable to the proposed use that was otherwise allowable. And, and there, I, I can see that that could be a situation where you could have uh, inconsistency found even though the use is specifically allowed but we don't have that in this case none of the policies that have been cited by opposing counsel in our opinion they're either immaterial and and not relevant because they don't really address the issue none of them are mandatory self-executing and specifically applicable to mining and that whole issue of compatibility that was the board made a decision kind of a legislative decision to put that into a different realm, which is implementation of the plan, not the plan itself, and that's through the conditional use process. So um, we think, you know, even if you can say, so we think as a matter of law, based on the principles that I've just enunciated, where a use is specifically allowable, and there's no countervailing self-executing mandatory policy that would trump it, then it's gonna be consistent as a matter of law, and what you find is, in every one of the cases, uh, um, th that that's what the courts ultimately seem to be saying. And, and it makes sense if yeah, you think I'm of it as under, a under, On the development plan, I'm, I'm assuming that this includes sort of a map of Pasco County and there are chunks of, of land that fall within these development categories. Is that how this is yes. working out? Yes, yeah. There's, there's a map that and, shows and the land use categories. And 
is the area we're talking about here that's zoned for this sort of rural agricultural, is this a big chunk of land? Uh, I don't know the exact amount, but it's a fairly large area. I mean, I in other words, I'm hundreds of acres. I'm struggling with the distinction between these decisions and zoning decisions, frankly. And, and, and so would the question be whether any place within this area you could put a limestone mine as compared to this particular lot? Is this particular lot then a zoning issue as compared to a development planning issue? This particular lot, and I can't speak for the surrounding area because I've not looked at the zoning map and I don't know that it's part of the record. This particular parcel, and it is part of the record, is zoned AC, agricultural commercial. Right. And agricultural commercial does specifically allow mining, including the extraction of lime rock. Um, and it's so the zoning is consistent the with the plan. The question here isn't whether it's zoned to allow for this, but the question here is whether the development plan allows for this, right? The, 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 develop, the, the, develop, the plan, future land use plan and map allow for mining um, and the zoning allows for mining. The question is whether or not the conditional use approval authorizing the ancillary activities associated with the mining is consistent with consistent. the plan. And our argument is that the use is allowed. The only qualification is that you get special approval and there are no specifically self-executing mandatory policies that apply to mining that would otherwise trump that specific allowance. And any issues about, the, you know, the, the vibration, the noise, uh, those sorts of things, that's addressed through the conditional use process. And, Your Honor, I, I did not find anywhere in either their brief or in any of the affidavits where the adequacy of the conditions was, in fact, challenged. All right. We need to wrap it up here. Uh, I think in some, Your Honors, uh, couple of additional points. One would be the, the whole issue of blasting, vibration, noise from blasting, et cetera. That has been preempted um, uh, from regulation by the county uh, under section 520.304 Florida statutes. Uh, so while it's certainly an issue associated with lime rock mining, it's not one that's cognizable under the comprehensive plan because it's been preempted uh, by state law. Um, as far as any additional points, I think that would, would really be, would wrap it up for us. Uh, we would ask that you um, find that there was no subject matter jurisdiction because this uh, change, conditional use approval, was not a development order as defined under uh, 38004. Uh, and secondly, even if you were to find that it is a development order and that the trial court had jurisdiction, that as a matter of law, the trial court was correct in its finding that it was inconsistent, that it was consistent with the plan as a matter of law. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Brooks. Your Honor, this was a motion for summary judgment. The burden was upon the movement to demonstrate that there were no disputed facts. I would like to be able to show you the future land use map, which I have here today, but it's not part of the record. It wasn't attached to their motion for summary judgment. Um, well, one of the things your opponent has said on that issue is that the disputed issues of fact with regard to the impacts of the rock mining on the surrounding homeowners is really not our focus. Our focus is whether or not the court's order was consistent with the comprehensive plan. I think the court was reviewing whether the county's conditional use permit was consistent with the comprehensive plan and they're supposed to apply strict scrutiny uh, to that analysis under 163.3215. This is different than the zoning. I contest the zoning and that's in a certiorari case in circuit court. They're not zoned, they're zoned master plan unit development for 19 residential units and, and, and they were allowed to do a sand mine. They were not, they, that changed the underlying zoning. The um, Judge Babb, uh, also found with regard to the first issue uh, that the uh, lime rock mine is not in the same class as a sand mine because the sand mine does not involve or involves excavation without ancillary processing where the lime rock mine involves ancillary processing. That was on uh, page four in paragraph seven of her order. So she even thinks it's development. The cases that are out there, Graves versus Pompano, Alachua County versus Eagle's Nest, Machado versus Musgrove. Uh, they all say that the act is to be broadly construed to accomplish the stated purposes and objectives. 
and that any order granting or granting with conditions an application for a permit is in fact a development order because it's an official action of local government having the effect of permitting the development of land. But for this conditional use permit, they could not do limestone mining or ancillary facilities. Um, this encompasses both. The master, the previous conditional use allowed sand mining for five years. So now they're amending it to change it to lime rock mining with the blasting, but with also this rock crushing uh, uh, plant that's gonna be constructed on the site and industrial looking facility uh, for 15 years. Um, 15 years uh, versus five years is a substantial change in the duration. Um, it's putting a child through elementary school versus putting a child from kindergarten all the way through the first three years of college. My appellants may not live through the next 15 years. So it's a substantial change. There's blasting, there's noise, much more attendant with the lime rock mine than sand mine. Um, key here is that this is a summary judgment case and it was decided too early in the process. We had just begun to take depositions. Um, my expert affidavits, of course, they uh, include the conditions because what they were opining about was the conditional use approval, uh, this conditional use permit, resolution 1314, that allows the lime rock mining with these conditions. They didn't expressly say, I went to look back and perhaps that's an oversight but the timing was that they were analyzing this. Without those conditions, the uh, county's own staff and the county's own commission found it to be inconsistent with the plan. So yes, the issue is, do these conditions make it consistent? The county commission decided that they did only after threat of lawsuit, threat of liability. Um, they may not be as impartial and in, uh, they may have some prejudice, some bias if they decide uh, that it doesn't and they know they're going to get sued and they're facing the defense cost potential liability it doesn't make them wholly and completely impartial that's why the legislature wanted it to come to the judicial branch when the county commissions that's subject to political vagaries and that's not a word that i'm using that's a word that the courts have used uh consider these development orders uh, and the legislature thought that the citizens should have an independent judiciary to go to to take a close look at these strict scrutiny, applying strict scrutiny in a de novo brand new hearing. Um, I know that circuit courts and the trial courts deal with many things every day from divorces to criminal practices and they don't typically like to review zoning cases. This isn't a zoning case, this is a comprehensive plan consistency case which the legislature specifically carved out this particular aspect of land use as important enough to merit independent judicial review and a de novo strict scrutiny uh, review. And they say also it's not just reviewing the table of uses and the map, it's reviews, reviewing each and every objective and element policy uh, that's in there and subjecting the uh, development order to strict scrutiny review does it meet all, meet all of those policies. And that's in Machado and explained very well in Pinecrest and also the Supreme Court just explains it in Brevard versus Snyder. They go through the whole history of why they changed this. Thank you very much for your time, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Last case on the docket is Gilroy v. Gilroy.